he looked me in my eyes and he told me, oh, you'll do it. He said, you know that little girl you introduced me to? He said that I'll make sure something happens to her. From birth, I feel that I was placed at a disadvantage. I was born to a schizophrenic mother. Um, she was not able to care for me because of her mental illness. I stayed with her until I was four, and just the neglect and the abandonment and having to be raised by my other brothers and sisters, um, it didn't work out. So I was placed with my aunt. My aunt was a very strict disciplinary. I grew up in church, um, and she did not know how to, I would say it became very physically um, abusive in her household. And parts of that were was from how she was raised and just became generational curses. Um, then at the age of four, I started to be sexually abused by some adult cousins who were also in the household. I did not tell because I was threatened um, by my cousins and as a child you don't know that that is wrong. At the age of 12 I became so um, angry because I could not understand why my mom was the way that she was and she's schizophrenic but I never knew what that word meant we just called her crazy so in my mind I didn't know why she was crazy um, and at the age of 12 I started acting out became um, very violent and disruptive went through juvenile court um, was placed in juvenile and I did not know that I was reacting off of the abuse that I was um, experiencing. At During that point when um, I remember one day meeting my aunt, um, I had come home from school and I had left some toothpaste in the sink from earlier that morning and she blacked my eye and I remember out of a reflex I hit her back. and. I was so ashamed, I just ran out the house. And about an hour or so later, I came back and the police was there. And they took me to juvenile court because I had hit an adult. And that was my first contact with the law, law enforcement. So at a very young age, I did not trust law enforcement at all. and then I was placed into foster care. From the age of 12 to 16, I had been placed in 42 different placements where I either ran away or I wasn't perfect enough. If I acted out once, I was sent back to um, defects. So I realized then that you had to be perfect in order to fit in and I was never perfect or enough for these homes. At the age of 16, I became uh, a teenage mom without any resources to provide for myself. I could not provide for my daughter. I sent her to stay with her father and I was devastated because I felt that not only did my mom not raise me, now I am repeating that I cannot raise my child and I've always wanted to be the best mom because I knew how it felt to be motherless. And I became suicidal. I was very um, depressed at that point. And a social worker told me that I could, I did not have anywhere else to go, that the next placement would be a mental institution. And at that point, I that was not an option for me. I felt like I was not crazy. I felt someone had failed me somehow. I just did not know um, who, or maybe I failed myself. I could not answer those questions. 
and I ran away from the last placement. We drove to Atlanta, and at that time, I did not, I grew up in the church. I was still very sheltered, even though I ran away a lot. I had not, at this point, um, engaged in too, too, too many things. So when she took me to a strip club, I really wasn't aware of what this type of place was, um, because we were on the outside, and I just saw the flashing lights, and I'm like, okay. I didn't put two and two together. At 16, you never put two and two together. Um, and she introduced me to this guy, and she said his name, he said his name was Sir Charles. And at that point, that did not bring, that was not a red flag for me. Um, he was an older guy in his 50s, kind of like a grandfather type. He looked at me and he said, wow, you're beautiful. And that was the first time that anyone had ever said that I was beautiful. And he told me, let's go for a ride. I rode with him. We rode um, around the city. And for the first time in my life, I felt like he had unlocked something inside of me. I don't know if it was him or just this, the desperation the point that I was at in life, but I felt like I wanted to tell him everything about me. I told him about my sexual abuse, I told him about my aunt and how I had got up until this point. He looked at me, he said, you don't have to live like that. He said, you're beautiful, you don't have to be homeless, you don't have to um, keep going in and out these systems. I know a way for you to provide for yourself. And he, there were like nine other girls. Some were younger than me. Um, no one was over 18. And I felt a connection with these girls because we, they welcomed me in. And a lot of people say that the life these, the lifestyle these girls live in is glamorized. I think what attracted me most was the family unit because I've never had a family before. And that felt really um, good to me to feel like I belong somewhere. And later that night, he took me back to the strip club where I had met him. And he told me um, that I would have to dance. And I went inside, this was the first time I went in, um, and I saw other girls, and these girls were beautiful. These girls, um, they were half clothed, but they were beautiful. Um, and they were making money, and that was attractive to me because I needed money, and I knew I needed money to survive and provide for myself and it looked like they were in control of the situation because no one was touching them against their will. That day I felt like I was letting myself down because I had been raised with morals and I felt like this is not right. But at the same time, I need to do this. That lasted about three days. On the third day, um, Sir Charles came and he told me that I wouldn't be going to the strip club anymore. And he took me to Metropolitan Avenue, which was formerly known as Stewart Avenue, and that is a location where girls are trafficked um, on a strip. And I'm in the car with him and he tells me all these things that I have to do, how much I have to charge, um, he tells me that I have to make a thousand dollars and all these things that I'm running through my head and I tell him no I'm not doing those things I told him that I was comfortable with the dancing if I couldn't dance and I wouldn't do anything else he looked me in my eyes and he told me oh you'll do it he said you know that little girl you introduced me to he said that 
I'll make sure something happens to her. I could see it, like, in his eyes that he was serious. And I had saw him the previous night be violent to one of the other girls. And at that time, I did not want to challenge him. I got out the car, um, and I'm standing, and I'm on the corner, and I realized that I realized that this is bad. How did I get from being homeless to here? All in a matter of, of days. And I felt like I wanted to run, but didn't know where to go because Sir Charles knew all the places that I knew. He was from my community. Um, and so I stood there and the girls, there were like eight or nine other girls on the corner. Um, and each time a car stopped, they would race to the cars because each girl was desperate because they had to make their thousand dollars quota, just like I had to. And if you didn't make that quota, you did not want to know the consequences. Um, so, and another dilemma that I had, I could not walk in the shoes that I had on. They were very high heels, and I remember stumbling and trying to walk. So I just stood there in about an hour or so. Um, the police rode up, and he shone this big bright light on me. And although I was ashamed because I was half clothed, um, I felt he's going to rescue me. Now is my time to escape. And I knew that Sir Charles was only a block away watching the whole um, thing. And he told me that if I got arrested, all the things that law enforcement would do and how embarrassing it would be. And he told me to say that I was waiting someone for someone if I got pulled over. And so the police shined this light on me and he says, hey you, what are you doing out here? And I tell him I'm waiting on someone. And he says, you don't belong out here. You belong on Peachtree Street, where the pretty girls are. I was lost for words. Like, I realized that this officer did not see me as a child. He did not see me as a human who's been bought and sold. He sees me um, as a prostitute, and I felt hopeless, and I... I felt like I didn't have any choices after that moment. Now I'm 18, and one night I got in the car with a buyer. Um, and I told him to go in one direction, and immediately he made a detour and went on the expressway. And he started um, shocking me with the some kind of, I don't know if it was a taser, the one with the lights, but it was hooked up to his um, cigarette lighter because I was trying to open the door. And instantly I just unplugged it and opened the car door and he, at this time he had accelerated up until 65 miles per hour and I jumped out of the car and I woke up three weeks later in the hospital. Sir Charles came and got me from the hospital. I had He had fake ID, birth certificate, social security card um, under another person's name. Um, and I was released and I healed, but something had changed inside of me. I no longer feared Sir Charles the way that I had feared him before. I said to myself, I said, if I stay with this guy, he says he's going to kill me. No, if I stay with him, I know that either he's going to kill me or the buyers are definitely going to kill me. But if I leave, he says he's going to kill me. 
end, to me, I felt that I had an option. I had choices. Do I stay or do I leave? So I chose to leave. One night I just got dressed as usual, um, went to the location where I was trafficked, which was Peachtree at this time, where the police officer had told me to go. Um, and I got in the car with a guy and I begged him, can you please take me somewhere away from here so that I can get away from um, my trafficker? And I told him at that time I said my pimp. Um, and he took me to a efficiency and paid for me a whole week and just left me there. Um, and I was able to get away. I dropped out of school in the 10th grade and I don't know anything apart from what I've been doing the last year and a half. So that was the first thing that I knew how to do. So I started exploiting myself and I got in contact, I got connected with this other girl who ran the escort service. Um, and I said, hey, I could start my own escort service and make a, a better, more, in my mind, I thought that I was making a safer environment for girls to make money, not children. I made sure they were 18 and over. And I felt that I was making it safer. I was not a pimp. I was not taking all their money. I was a referral service. But in actuality, I was an enabler. I was enabling unhealthy behavior. And I didn't realize that until 2006. I was arrested for charges that are not related to um, this issue. To make a long story short, I only served three years. And when I got out, those three years were the most quiet moments of my life because I had time to really figure out why I was at this point in my life. How did I fall this low? Um, and I realized that I'm 26 and I'm still blaming my aunt, I'm still blaming my trafficker, I'm still blaming everyone for where I am now at 26. And I had an awakening, like, I cannot lo no longer blame anyone else for what's happening to me but myself. And I took charge of that. I said, I'm in control from this point on. And I chose to forgive. I forgave my molesters. I forgave my aunt. And I wrote them letters. I forgave my trafficker. I didn't write him a letter, but I forgave him anyway. Um, I forgave all the people that abused me in foster care. Everybody that I had been holding on to and continuing to victimize myself. Um, and I released and I started to restore myself. And I had to take myself all the way back to that 12 year old girl that I felt I left behind and reconnected with her and really figure out what was she like if my life had not been derailed by domestic sex trafficking? What were my goals? What did I want to be when I was younger? What, and I started, I remember I used to like to write and I used to like to read a lot. So during those three years, I wrote a book titled Motherless Child and just start doing things that, and I reconnected with that child and kind of like lived my life from that point up until now and erased all the bad things that had happened to me.
the weight of the bitterness and the anger and the pain had become so heavy and it was just destroying my life. And I realized that I cannot carry it any longer, that I have to release it. And to me, forgiving those who had done all these horrific things to me was the only way that I could release and move forward. Because if I stayed where I was, I was either going to spend those 25 years in prison or I was going to die um, because or become a drug addict or or something that I did not um, want to happen to me. So I just said that, you know what, I'm going to forgive these people, not because of them, but because of me so that I can move forward. And that's what I chose to do.